Hey, this is Father Steve, Episcopal priest serving here in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland, and we're doing this study of uh, the study book Revelation. Uh, this recording is for chapter 16 of the study of Revelation. Um, and as I repeat each time, each week, uh, one of the study sources we use, besides the Bible, uh, N.T. Wright for Everyone Bible Study Guides, Revelation 22 studies for individuals and groups. Uh, a lot of your questions come out of this book right here. I encourage you to purchase that book. Um, also, as I mentioned, each week, uh, each recording, I encourage you to uh, study, do Bible study in a group setting, uh, more than one, especially uh, the book of Revelation. Um, and do it, um, don't rush through the, any Bible study, don't rush through, but particularly don't rush through Revelation, a lot of symbolism, a lot of symbolism. So, anyway, I encourage you to go ahead and read chapter 16 of Revelation. Again, you can pause this video, hit that, um, that symbol looks like the number 11 or upside down equal sign. Um, pause here, read chapter 16, come back, and then I will read a few of my notes on chapter 16, and then we'll get into uh, discussion. Now, you may want to, uh, especially those who are using uh, this as a study series for Bible study in their individual churches, you may want to spend a little bit more time with chapter 16 because the questions I'm going to ask coming out of N.T. Wright's book are very thought-provoking, very thought-provoking, and will generate discussion. So anyway, go ahead and read chapter 16, and um, we'll come back. Okay. So the seven bowls are poured out. So verse 1, a loud voice. A voice is usually that of an angel, but here it is a voice of God. Uh, verse 3, this plague is different from the Nile being turned into blood. Here the whole sea is turned into blood. Uh, verses uh, 4 through 7, the third bowl contaminates all fresh water into blood. And then we look at verse 15, call to maintain vigilance. Come as a thief in the middle of the night. Where have we heard this before? Well, we look at Matthew 24, 43, and 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 2. We see this about being prepared. Verse 16, Armageddon. In Hebrew, Armageddon, this word is found nowhere else. So Armageddon, Hebrew, for Armageddon is found nowhere else. Verses 17 through 21, the seventh bowl, lightning and thunder, the phenomena normally accompany major interventions of God, and destroyed in three parts. No longer will a tenth of the city be destroyed, but the entire city will be destroyed, Babylon, or what we know as Rome. Okay? So, let's look at, see what N.T. Wright has to say on uh, the seventh plague, the seven plagues in Revelation 16. And a little intro that he writes. The lunch had been substantial. The meeting was tedious. The room was warm and the speakers droned on and on. The chairman noticed that one of his colleagues was finally subsiding into slumber. With cruel timing, he waited until the poor man's head had come to rest on his arms, folded on the table in front of him. Then, interrupting the speaker, he said, Perhaps Dr. Johnson would like to give us his opinion on this matter. We all looked at our colleague, by now happily asleep. His neighbor dug him in the ribs, pulled back out of his dream. He had no idea that he had been asked a question, let alone what it was about. That's the kind of shock that Johnson ministers to his hearers in verse 15. Suddenly, in the midst of the terrible last three plague oracles, he turns to them and says, Hey, stay awake at the back. There, Jesus is on the way. And you don't want to be caught half naked, do you? So, icebreaker question, opening question. Have you ever unintentionally fallen asleep somewhere in public? How were you awakened? <laughs> I can think of several ways I was awakened. So, or fell asleep. Um, it's always said if you're, uh, one of the things, if you're ever at work and you fall asleep at your, your desk or cubicle and uh, um, supervisor comes and wakes you up, 
Just say amen. <laughs> say I was praying. Okay. So verses 1 through 9, what are each of the four bowls of wrath poured out on and what do they have in common? Read Revelation 1 through 9, which you've already done. Read the whole um, chapter 16. What are each of the four bowls of wrath poured out on and what do they have in common? Okay. And you can pause this where you want to pause this video. I'm going to just keep moving on. Okay. What then are the implications and significance of these four bowls? Why does the angel of the waters burst out in praise when the third bowl of wrath is poured out on the rivers and springs? And this is verses uh, 4 through 6. Why does the angel of the waters burst out in praise when the third bowl of wrath is poured out on the rivers and the springs? Now, as I said, you may want to do this um, a little bit more, um, longer, uh, because uh, this is... Chapter 16 is, has a lot of discussion, okay? So, this question is kind of long, or a comment in a question. The wrath of the Creator God consists of two things. Principally, first, He allows human wickedness to work itself out, to reap its own destruction. Second, He steps in more directly to stop it, to call time on it when it's got out of hand. If we knew our business, we would thank God for both of these, even though both can appear harsh. They need to be. If they were le any less harsh, less than harsh, the wickedness in question would merely pause, furrow its brow for a moment, and then carry on as before. Question, how do we see a mixture of both these types of wrath in these first four bowls or plagues? How do we see a mixture of both of these types of wrath in these first four bowls or plagues? Okay. Again, remember, you can pause this to go, but I'm going to just kind of keep moving on here. What we are faced with in this chapter is neither a capricious or ill-tempered divine being nor a careless, laissez-faire world ruler. We are faced with a God who made the world and whose generous love is seen most clearly in a sacrifice of his own son, the Lamb, the one who shares his very throne. Question. How does the picture of God we find in this chapter reshape the way we understand the nature of love and our idea of how God extends his love to us? And I think we've been talking about this last couple chapters, okay? All right, moving on. Read Revelation 16, verses 10 through 21. What is the target of the fifth plague? What is the target of the fifth plague? Okay. Those who fall under judgment here are those who have been given every chance to repent and have refused. They have chosen to go down with the monsters rather than to suffer and be vindicated with the Lamb. I had an interesting question from a parishioner this past Sunday. How do I understand suffering? And I mentioned to this person to do some study, and we were talking about this in Revelation, to what, what is suffering and how to um, comprehend suffering, especially among someone who is in more, uh, more things going on in their life than other people. Okay? The sixth plague awakens again, as in Revelation 9, the deep-seated fear in John's society about the great enemy to the east, in their case, uh, Parthia. The Euphrates River formed the boundary, and like the River Rhine in Europe, was a natural barrier, relatively easy to defend. But the sixth angel's bowl, when poured out, dries up the river, so as to prepare the way for a very different kind of exodus. Instead of the children of Israel going dry shod through the Red Sea, the kings from the east can now charge with their armies across the river, ready to attack. Why are the kings of the earth drawn into such a foolish confrontation? That's um, verses 13 to 14. Why are the kings of the earth drawn to such a foolish confrontation? Okay. Again, remember you need to pause it. Pause it. Okay, let's take a look at verse 15. 
Why does John suddenly issue an encouragement to his readers to stay awake? Okay, and I mentioned that in my notes here. Where have we heard about stay awake? Question, how do we also need to wake up to what is happening around us in the world? How do we also need to wake up to what is happening around us in the world? Verse 17. Why does a voice from the throne announce it is done after the seventh bowl of wrath is poured out? Why does the voice from the throne announce it is done after the seventh bowl of wrath is poured out? That's verse 17. Okay, I have one more question, and then I'm going to make a closing comment on uh, chapter 16. And in this, um, we're looking at verses 17 through 21. The vision of the seventh plague, verses 17 to 21, does not reveal the collapse of the physical earth. John's hearers would have no difficulty in getting the point since the prophets use the same sort of metaphorical language to describe God's judgment on the nations in their day, not the literal end of the planet, which is obviously didn't happen back then. Look at Isaiah uh, chapter 24, for example. Terrible things will happen in human society, for which the only fitting metaphor will be earthquakes and huge hailstorms, hailstorm, hailstones. This is the only way to describe the collapse of the entire social and political system on the earth. As we consider these, this news of the impending collapse of the world's idolatrous systems, its economic, social, environmental, and political systems, what does it mean to be faithful in the present? What does it mean to be faithful in the present? And this may go back to the question of suffering. This may be a more explanation of suffering. Okay? So chapter 16 uh, will generate a lot of discussion. You may want to uh, do this. Um, maybe you've done this for the other chapters in um, several sessions and not just one setting. Now, I want to read about what he says, a note on Revelation 16, and this is probably starting to bring Revelation all into play, besides the symbolism and all that. As with the seals and the trumpets, the first four bowls seem to belong to one set and the last three to another. Unlike the seals and the trumpets, however, there is no gap, no pause between the sixth and the seventh, just as there is no chance now of further time for repentance. Let me, re let me repeat that. And talk about, you know, coming as a thief in the middle of the night. Unlike the seals and the trumpets, however, there is no gap, no pause between the sixth and the seventh, just as there is no chance now for further time for repentance. Nonetheless, as mentioned above in verse 15, John wants to make sure we are not lulled into complacency. It is a serious danger that deceitful spirits be let loose into the world. Be alert, keep awake, stay faithful. Okay? So there we go. That's uh, chapter 16 of the study of the book of Revelation. And um, as we know, there's 22 chapters in the study of Revelation. And uh, as we get in here in a few more weeks, maybe we'll combine a couple chapters and uh, we'll get through this. God bless.